Okay, we're going to get started. Um, the first observation is, holy crap, there's a lot of people interested in polyglot programming today. If you consider that we're up against the script bowl a couple rooms over, those are also people that are interested in seeing multiple languages together. Um, five years ago, we'd probably have a hard time getting 15 or 20 people at a boff to talk about polyglots. So I think uh, the Java community has kind of turned this corner now and you're interested to see more about using multiple languages together. And hopefully we'll provide that today. Um, all, all dummies books always start with definitions, so we popped open a dictionary and looked up polyglot, knowing we're using several languages. Of course, we're only going to be talking about programming languages today. It's a little pedantic, but it is a dummies talk. Um, so the things we're going to talk about today um, is why you'd want to consider using um, polyglot. Um, and we'll give you some sample ideas, um, maybe to spark some creativity in how to use polyglot. And then we'll get down into some details of how to actually communicate between languages. Uh, we both work on JRuby as our day job. Um, we both really like Ruby. Um, this is sort of an interesting challenge for us because we like to sell Ruby. Um, but we're not going to try to actively sell Ruby over any other language. And in fact, we shouldn't because every language has its own benefits and they all play nicely together. Um, you will see a, a little bit more Ruby than other languages, but that's just because we know that language quite a bit better. And I, I'm Tom Enabo, by the way, and this is Charles Nutter. I'm Charles Nutter, yes. And actually, one thing I wanted to say about the, the, the polyglot aspect here, it seems like there's a lot of folks that say, you really want to be a polyglot, so only use my language. And it really doesn't make any sense. We live on a platform now that has lots of languages available. They all have their own special areas where they fit and different things that they're able to do. So we need to find a way to, uh, to make them all work well together and you know, kind of keep the polyglot dream alive because it, it actually does work a lot better than just saying we're going to switch everything over to one language. So perhaps uh, um, the phrase isn't use the best tool for the job, it's to use the best tools for the job. Right. I've never seen a, a carpenter build a house with just a screwdriver. Um, so this is sort of the um, vision that most people have of Java, that there's just one language. But actually Java was designed with two languages from the offset um, or from the outset, uh, you would uh, write something in Java, it would compile it down to Java bytecode, and that's actually what the JVM knows how to run. And that's not polyglot. Um, unless, you're, unless you're mixing a lot of bytecode and, and Java directly in your projects, which I don't think a lot of people do. Um, so by mid-1996, there were several languages that were starting to appear. Um, they're directly um, targeting Java bytecode. And all of them know how to talk to the Java language well. And so by 1996, we already had some form of polyglot in existence. Um, so why would you want to use polyglot? The answer is uh, surprisingly mundane. Um, basically, Java isn't the best language for everything. If you think it is, then you probably are a dummy. Um, a, a more nuanced uh, um, retort to this would be, but isn't Java, Java good enough for all the things I'm doing? And we obviously can't answer that. It, it could be, but more than likely some portion of a large application you're writing, it's definitely not. Right, and, and we want to emphasize that we're not trying to push the idea that you should move over to these other languages just because they're available. If Java does everything that you want it to do exactly as well as you need it done, then you're fine. You know, we're, These are other tools for solving problems in different and be possibly better ways. Uh, if you don't need those better ways, then maybe you're doing okay now. Um, so who are the polyglotters today? You are. Uh, being a little cheesy. Um, but the truth is, if you write any web application, you're already working in, in many different languages. And you can look at this, these, this list and go, oh, well, they're all domain specific. And this is actually a really good clue for when you actually want to use Polyglot in your own application. You need to start, ooh, yep. 
This is a reason to not have mirrored displays. Um, you can actually look at the domains within your application and figure out the uh, um, best piece, the best language for the best piece. So, for example, you can use Scholar Closure for concurrency. There are uh, functional programming languages, and so, someone has their hand up. Uh, can you change your Twitter to Oh. No. No. Uh, <laughs> Is there any way that we can turn down the, uh, the gam a little bit on these displays? You know, generally the, the problem isn't that it's too bright, it's usually that it's too dark. Um, this most of these slides have a white background with uh, um, darker text for the actual snippets. Like you have no problems reading ideas up, up at the top, right? It's just this bluish on white thing. Okay, we'll, we'll just keep going. There's not many of these. So that's, it's all right. Just go, just go. Um, so you might use a, a, um, a functional programming language for concurrency because they have a better concurrency story than using new thread. Um, at the top tendrils of your application, you might decide you want to use a dynamic language um, to have a, a more mutable layer. Yeah, that's no problem. Um, oh, I, I should also point out that the guy who gave the talk right before us, Venkats, uh, uh, um, or Venkat, um, this is actually his, uh, his picture from his Learning Scala book, good book. Uh, so yeah, basically, you know, the way, same way that you'd break up any typical application into subdomains or sub-libraries for, for different pieces, uh, that's really the best way that you look at doing polyglot programming, too. Uh, find the right domain for a particular language and use it there. Uh, you don't have to have all of the languages all the time in every part of your application. You find a place where it fits well and then isolate it as a service or a, a library. It's usually the cleanest way to keep things separated. And we'll, we'll come back to this, this slide and show some examples of what we mean for a couple areas. Um, Venkat got his inspiration for this slide from Ola Beanie's uh, um, Fractal Programming blog. We'll put this URL at the end if you're interested in reading about it. Um, so what are some benefits of not using Java? Um, syntax actually does matter. Um, I don't know how many times... Uh, um, I've looked at a Java class and it was devoid of a lot of actual information. It was mostly just boilerplate. And in fact, I, I, I hear people talk about, oh, well, that's no problem. I have an IDE. It just generates, you know, thousands of lines of getters and setters. Now, if you go and look at the classes on the right, they're much more concise and pretty easy to read. Now, this, this is a totally trivial, mundane example, but Syntax really does matter. If we, if we go to a slightly bigger example, um, we have something that gets a list of uh, addresses and then we sort those addresses by name and then we print them out. This isn't too much code. Um, we do have to implement our own comparator and that's not too much code by itself. But now if you compare this to pretty much any other language that's on the JVM today, they're all basically one line statements. Not only are they one-line statements, they're fluent, they read nice. Database addresses sort by name, for each one print the address's name. I think that looks a hell of a lot better than this. Um, the closure one doesn't read quite as nicely <laughs> because the functions are up front, but you spend a day with closure and this, this will look beautiful as well. Um, closures do matter. Um, I just wanted to point out something. Had, had list actually had a sort method on it, instead of forcing you to use collections.sort, then this Java example would have looked a lot nicer. Unfortunately, we still have that. Um, well, at least until Java 8, but Java 8's, what, a year away? And uh, it's probably going to be at least a year after that until you can use it. However, you know, even if you can use closures in Java, um, 
The other thing is paradigms also matter. Um, the primary paradigms of your programming language affects the idioms that your community makes for the language and those idioms are based on the strengths of those paradigms. Um, so for example, you can do functional programming in Java but you're actually working against the common idioms that the Java community has already developed and it might not be so easy. Um, whereas if you used closure, um, the language versus <laughs> the feature I was just talking about, um, everything about the language tries to encourage you to not have mutable state. Most of the data, well, all their data structures are immutable. Um, when you do actually have something mutable, they force you to put them into a transaction. So this is, this is sort of the opposite of what Java would do um, as an object oriented language. Um, and so if you decided you wanted to parallelize a task, in closure, it might be incredibly easy to do that because you know that there's no mutable state and you're off to the races. However, if there is a mutable state, because it's explicitly marked in your code, you actually know what you're up against. So paradigms really matter quite a bit. Another nice thing about all the other languages is they have a read eval print loop. Um, you run Groovy, type println hello world, you can see a print of the screen, and this triple equals greater than null is the return value of evaluating that expression. Now you get a prompt back, um, you could set variables, you can load in libraries and play with things interactively instead of having to create a project or constantly saving things to uh, a text editor. Or create a build file and run, run ant or maven every time to run stuff. Exactly. Ah, oh, look, you can do the same thing in Scala. Ah, you can do the same thing in Clojure. And I, I just want to point out that Clojure is pretty cool because uh, it's fairly reflective. Here I was curious how the trampoline method was implemented, so I just asked for the source and I printed it out. Another, another extra cool thing about uh, the Lisp variety of um, languages is that they typically have documentation as a first class citizen of the language. So I could have did doc trampoline and I would just return that, that string to me, which is a great thing to have in a REPL. And so we're experienced with one REPL in particular, which is our own. All right, so I'm, I'll just run through the, the typical Ruby demo to kind of show how you can really get the interactive feel by, by having a REPL. Uh, where's mine here? All right, everybody can see that okay? All right, so here we are in a, a JRuby REPL, uh, pretty much the same sort of set of features that you have in any of the others. You can still call into Java. You can call into all of the Ruby features. Uh, you know, we can print out hello. Yes? I think you've got your mic set next to your fan. There you go. <laughs> wow, awesome. <laughs> uh, and you know, all the typical things, it's, it's much easier to play with all these languages because they have some sort of interactive REPL. And a lot of them actually, even when you deploy on a server, there's ways that you can get into a REPL that connects up to the server and try stuff out. Uh, now, of course, if we want to play with Java objects, we can do that too. JavaX. No, oh, yep. It's been a while. All right. So we can create a new frame and we've got access to it and it's all still live again. Uh, let's get our frame up here so we can see it. Off in the corner there somewhere. And that'll be annoying. Uh, and one another thing we'll talk about a little bit later is uh, a lot of these languages have easier ways of accessing Java APIs. Uh, rather than doing sets and gets, maybe we have it as property access. So we can do something like always on top equals true and it's going to just call the set always on top method as well for you. Uh, let's make this a little bit bigger. You know, notice we also do like, we convert the Java casing into Ruby casing to kind of make it feel a little bit better. 300 by 300. All right, so we've got a bigger frame now. We'll just run through and create a button. All right, add that to the frame. And, and Rebels give you the ability to go back to command history and 
go up and back if you screw up, which Charlie did that first time with using Java into the Java X. You can go and save uh, um, expressions, the last expression to a variable with magic syntax. There's lots and lots of features. And so well, finally, we'll actually make it do something. You can show that this is all still really interactive and we're, we're adding new behavior to it as it runs. Uh, it's all just still in the same JVM here. And um, we'll just set the text to something. Okay. Uh, and so we're doing add action listener here, which we've also snake cased or underscore cased for Ruby. Uh, but in Ruby, as in most of the other languages, it's also possible to just take a closure, take a piece of code, and pass it in as uh, an implementation of an interface. Can you drag up the top? Oh, it's stuck machines. down there. There we go. So we run that, and then if everything works as it's supposed to, whoops, it doesn't. <laughs> Demo gods, not with us today. What did I do wrong? Did it, oh, you gotta, you gotta provide an argument for the event. Oh, that's what it was. Uh, yeah, caps lock. There we go. I'll try that. So we get our error, but we've got the additional a action listener on there that works for, for you and it's all live. Uh, so you can imagine if you have this on a server and you're, you, all you're doing for polyglot wise is having access to the objects on the server to be able to see what the services are doing, uh, it's a very simple and quick way to get into polyglot without even making a dive into a specific language. All right, back to that. Got it. All right, so um, what reasons might you not want to use polyglot? Um, this is sort of a joke. Um, you can make a big technology decision that can backfire on you. And if you make any technology decision, you might be incredibly afraid. Um, this is Patton, I guess, hitting someone who <laughs> broke down on the battlefield. Not, not cool. Um, but if you do have a poor relationship with the rest of your team, you probably shouldn't be making any technology decisions. You need to probably repair some bridges and get buy-in first. Although for most of us, we actually have a pretty good relationship with the rest of our team. Um, it's probably better to ask for forgiveness than permission. You don't want too many cooks in the kitchen. And Gandhi loves polyglot. If, if, if you are a team leader, an architect, and you make a decision and you're sitting there saying, tomorrow we're going to start using Scala, and there's a bunch of frowns on everyone's faces. You should take that as a serious warning that they're not ready yet. Because we all know as programmers, if you'd make an unpopular cultural decision, um, odds are it's not going to work out. It's just the strange side effect of programmers being very independent minded. Um, Another thing is you might jump on the bandwagon too early. It's just too awesome, so you use it too soon. You won't be able to hire anyone. There won't be any documentation. You'll find yourself asking obscure questions on forums and reading through source code. And a year later, you'll be one of the three people who are still using it. Um, don't, don't use that technology. Unless, unless you really want to be on that vanguard. Um, and that has improved a lot over the past few years, too. Uh, the languages that we're talking about here have several books each, uh, large communities. Uh, there are folks out there that are looking to work in those languages and, and looking for jobs using them. Uh, it's, it, it'll improve over time, but uh, these languages in particular are doing pretty well in those areas. Yeah, oh yeah, nothing we're talking about today is going to be dead on the vine next year. Good, good qualifier. Um, so one thing we run into personally is people will be going across language boundaries and then they'll get an exception. They'll get this stack trace and the stack trace will be like, you know, 3,000 long or something. And there'll be a lot of artificial backtrace frames for the implementation of the language itself. Now, over time, this is another thing that's gotten a lot better. The number of frames have greatly reduced and it's getting easier and easier to see what language element you're actually hitting. And in Vogue Dynamic, this is going to get quite a bit better. Um, more, more frames are going to disappear, but there's always going to be some slight difference from just using that single Java language that might bug you. And if it does bug you, 
you know, you should get over it. But if you can't get over it, then don't, don't do it. Um, probably a more serious operational issue is you might decide you want to use a language and that language pulls in some other dependencies and there's a version mismatch because you're already using a different version of that same library. Of course, that's not a, that's not a drop dead issue assuming you can go and update those other dependencies but it's kind of a serious issue if you can't get around it. And it's not even an issue specific to language implementations. You pull in a library X, it probably depends on a few others that uh, you may run into. So this isn't unusual. Yeah, it's a generic Java problem. Right. right. Yeah. And, and likewise, this is also a generic problem. You might decide that you really like this language and you're going to put it on a cell phone and then it pulls in, you know, 30 megabytes of jars. That's probably not going to work. Um, this one's totally a joke. Um, you know, this is polyglot for dummies. Uh, you might think you have an awesome idea. Whenever you want to go and uh, introduce some new technology that most people don't know about in your team, you really want to go and uh, um, bounce it off them and co-opt them before you actually make the proposal. Have them play devil's advocate. So, um, now we're on to the next. So we thought we'd break this up by kind of talking about a couple of these domains that you can split your application up into. Uh, and probably the, 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 the quickest one and the, and the first one that you might run into is some sort of DSL written in one of these languages, uh, especially written in the dynamic languages, for example. Uh, so tools are where as we see a lot of people start to get polyglot into an application or into a dev shop uh, because it's pretty easy. One of those tools that, that's gotten more and more popular recently is Gradle. Gradle was build automation. Uh, it's written with, you write your builds with Groovy. It basically does everything that Maven or Ant does for you uh, with a lot of additional options for automating the rest of the system, automating deployment and so on. Uh, and of course, you know, rather than using XML, we're using Groovy in this case. And it still does have all the features of the typical build tools you're used to. Uh, but even better than that, you can do simple imperative code in here. Uh, so building a, having a build tool that is also a scripting language, an internal DSL, gives you the opportunity to be able to do an imperative loop or an if statement, uh, things that are much more difficult in declarative setups like Ant or Maven. And pretty much every language has their own option for these tools. So if you're interested in starting to play with Clojure or starting to play with Scala, uh, maybe you look at Leiningen, the Clojure build tool, or you look at the SBT, the Scala build tools. Uh, and this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, each of these languages does have their own ways of expressing uh, particular concepts. The, the various options that we have across all these languages may be better at particular domains. And of course, if you want to use one of these languages, it's nice that you don't always have to go back to Ant to build things or that you're all, not always forced to use Gradle, for example. Uh, they also bring their own flavor and their own way of doing things uh, to each of these different domains. So when some things that Rake does well, uh, maybe Leiningen doesn't do as, as cleanly as, or as nicely. And tools really are probably the easiest way for you to start getting polyglot stuff into a shop. Uh, you start building things that aren't on the critical path of your application, uh, scripting the build process, scripting other parts of your, your, your deployment aspects. Uh, and it's, it's decoupled from your application, so you're not as worried about breaking the main line application. It's a lot, not as scary for decision makers or for the day-to-day develop, -day developers to bring it into the system. Uh, and it, it get, helps you get a, a quick feel for how the language works and whether you would want to start using it to write services and critical path code in the application. Uh, another quick way that you can start getting languages into a given shop is to use it for testing. Uh, and in, in, a large, in a lot of cases, dynamic languages make it far easier to do testing of even regular Java applications uh, than if you were to try and write all that in Java. I, I still have not heard a good answer from anybody about how you do test-driven development for real in a statically typed language if you can't actually compile the test and run it. Uh, and there's lots of excuses and, and other ways that you can get around that, but <laughs> writing these tests in a dynamic language, you can actually do your behavior-driven or test-driven development entirely ahead of time. And I, I was just going to say for the JRuby project, over time, we, we started with a lot of uh, um, JUnit tests, and those are just slowly getting eaten away and being replaced with RSpec. Right. So here's, uh, here's an example from, from Ruby, from JRuby, uh, using RSpec, which is a behavior-driven development tool. Uh, and we're just testing a standard Java class here. 
uh, pull it in, call methods on it, uh, get this nice fluent interface that list should be empty, uh, list add content, and that should be true, get zero should be whatever we put into that list. Uh, another way, a nice way of looking at how you do testing, first of all, but we could write this entire test against a class that doesn't exist and just see that it fails and then build out method after method that actually will finally make those tests pass. Don't have to worry about the compile phase. It makes it a lot easier to really do test driven or test first development. It also has really good error output because that describe at the top, array list when first created should be empty failed. Right, exactly. So rather than trying to come up with uh, cute names for your test methods and then digging around in a, a result to find out what actually failed, you can have individual lines of text that say what failed, what didn't fail, uh, and, and why it failed within that particular piece of code. And again, every language seems to have their own testing technology. Right, so. exactly. I think all of them have pretty much uh, uh, both a straight up unit testing sort of framework in Ruby, it's uh, test unit. Uh, and they also all have this sort of behavior driven or specification driven development tool. Now when we're talking about DSLs, one way that you can start to use them is finding a server or a framework that already provides it. Uh, some servers and platforms actually have native support for these languages. Uh, they build their own little DSL or their own little wrapper around the services that you would write right directly to in Java, uh, but then you can start using the language without a lot of the integration concerns we'll talk about later. Uh, for example, Torquebox and Immutant are basically JBoss combined with Ruby or Clojure. Uh, all the typical services that you'd expect from a JBoss application server with a nice Ruby or Clojure face on them and we're kind of expanding that out uh, to other languages. And Grails, when you look at it, is really a DSL around Spring and the various services that Spring provides. Uh, so you do a Grails application, you can write everything in Groovy, deploy it and use services written in any other language and not have to ever really think too much about how to integrate all those together. Which I think is probably the cleanest way to do Polyglot. Keep things separated, keep things behind service or interface layers uh, and ideally if you can find servers or frameworks that wire that stuff up for you. So we'll look quick at a, a couple of examples here from, uh, from the, the JBoss versions of this. So Torquebox is basically all of the enterprise services within JBoss wrapped with nice Ruby front ends. Uh, it kind of fits the Ruby sensibility, so if you're trying to be a Ruby programmer on the JVM, it fits a little bit more how Ruby programmers want to work. Uh, and it provides services that Rubyists use and it provides services that you use with a nice face on them. Uh, this is kind of the, the general structure of both Torquebox and uh, Immutant. Uh, all of the typical services you see but with a new API on top of it, a new front end and, and a way of wor working with them. Uh, so things like domain friendly configs that you can have within this setup, uh, Ruby and Clojure both have this. Rather than doing it in an XML file, we can have a, either an inter a DSL that lets us do standard Ruby code or YAML on the other side, which is a markup language but a little bit less verbose than XML. Uh, very clean ways of getting at queues and topics or any of the other services. Uh, on the left we've got configuration for a, couple, for a queue and a topic in Ruby as the DSL and on the other side uh, the same thing in a YAML file if, that, if you want to use more of a, a text driven thing. Again this is just a very thin veneer over Java APIs. Right, exactly. All of these are still doing the same sort of configuration within the server to set up queues and topics uh, but providing it in a way that fits Ruby or feels right for a Ruby program. Here we're actually using the queue and the topic. Pretty clean, cleaner than the code that you'd probably have to write for this in Java. Uh, and, and it focuses on what you actually would want to use. The, the key features, the default features you're normally going to get at are the easy ones rather than everything being equally difficult. Uh, so a mutant, kind of the same thing but for closure, uh, with closure sensibilities. Again, the configuration here, uh, you know, code is data and data is code and config is data, so code is config. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, and this is a, a way you can set up the server. You have all of your dependencies prepared. Here's a more, uh, a longer example of basically an entire application that's written for Immutant in Clojure. Uh, we're loading in messaging, we're loading in scheduled jobs, daemonization of stuff. And then we have it all available as a closure DSL to, to build and use this stuff. And remember what I mentioned before, some languages and some servers actually set up REPLs for you. Uh, here about halfway down we have a REPL started up on port 4321. 
So if you connect into that, you actually can use a closure REPL to see what the application's doing, try out the messaging system, try out, ch schedule jobs and make sure everything's working properly. Uh, something that Polyglot is kind of bringing to what's normally a kind of black box of, of a server. All right. Yeah. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about concurrency. Um, new thread sucks. Um, setting up synchronized blocks sucks. Um, so use a better concurrency model. Um, the one we're going to show today is uh, Akka. It's an uh, actor framework that's written in Scala. You set up a, a series of actors into a space and they just send messages and receive messages asynchronously. Um, we're not going to actually explain how to write concurrent programs using actors. This is really just meant to give you a feel of how this different model will look if you're, if you're coding. And like, we, like we've been talking about, breaking up your application into specific domains, uh, Akka has a Java API that they ship. They're also, also oh, a Scala API. I didn't show that. But, uh, but it's basically just a Scala library that has been wrapped up and you use it and you're basically doing some polyglot work. So if we, if we look at what uh, this API looks like or this framework looks like in Scala, I'll just read down from top to bottom. We define a simple greeting class that has a who field, um, followed by we define an actor. You can see that it extends actor and we load in some logging. We have a receive function that if it receives a greeting message, um, then it'll log that. At the bottom, we, we set up the system for, to put actors this is kind of a lame example because there's only a single actor in it. Um, but on the next line, we set up the greeter and, and stick it into this, that, that space. In the last line, we fire off a greeting message to that actor asynchronously. And that, that exclamation point is kind of a fire and forget operation. So if there was some more code right below that, then um, it may or may not execute next because we fired it off asynchronously. We don't know when the actor is going to receive it or if it's ever going to receive it for that matter. Um, here's what the Java API looks like. It largely looks the same. Um, we have a struct class again at the top. The um, greeting actor extends a slightly different class and receive is now called on receive, but it's the same. Um, the bottom is almost exactly the same except instead of an exclamation point, there's a tell method which is this, does the same thing. Now, uh, my experience with using Akka is through a library called Mika. It's, uh, it's a thin uh, API around Akka's Java API. Um, again, Charlie just explained that thin wrappers are great for DSLs and this really does feel like a Ruby API to me. Um, so let's, let's look at an example, wonky music. It's, it's a little bit crazy. I only have so many jokes in here, so. Um, Elise uh, Heard originally wrote this. I kind of rewrote it a little bit. Um, so there's four actors in this example. You have a conductor and you have three instruments. Um, the conductor comes into being first and then the three instruments um, come into being. As soon as they come into being, they as asynchronously fire off an event um, with a message of themselves. Um, and here's what the basic setup looks like. Um, we create a, a system called wall of sound and then we first register our conductor and then we register the three, um, the three instruments and pass them as a message to that conductor asynchronously. So now instead of bang or tell, we use less than less than because that feels better from a Ruby perspective. Um, another nice thing about Ruby I just want to point out, um, Guitar, drum, and bass are actually classes. In, in Ruby, classes are just objects, so we can pass them in and assign them to variables and just use them however we want, which I think is a lot nicer than, I wish Java had it. All right, well, here's what the conductor looks like. Um, you can see that it extends actor, but it's not an Akka actor, it's a Mika actor. This was a strategy that the author used to uh, make his thin layer isolated from the actual Akka class, so he's using a little bit of delegation here. This allows him to add additional methods without cluttering up the actual Akka class. 
Uh, if we look at the receive uh, um, method itself, if the message isn't a string called finale, um, we just assume it's an instrument registering itself and then we send a message saying, hey, start playing. And that's exactly what it does. Now all three of these are also asynchronous. Now the thing you might be thinking is, the instruments asynchronously said, hello, I'm here, and then this said, sent back each one say, you can start playing asynchronously. We have no idea when these instruments are going to start. So this is arguably one of the worst conductors ever. <laughs> um, Here's what, the, here's what an individual instrument looks like. There's really no behavior in it. Um, but if we look at the bass class, um, there's a receive message. If it receives a play message, then it calls play. Receives finale, it does play finale. Um, the actual class name is used to figure out which uh, um, MP3 to play, basically. Um, the drum is a little bit special. When it gets done playing its little song, it tells the conductor that it wants to play a finale. The conductor's not very smart and just goes, yeah, go for it. Maybe it's just jamming. Um, and here's how the drum's implemented. Play calls its uh, um, instruments play and then after it's done, it sends its finale message to the conductor and as we saw earlier, the conductor, if it sees a finale, it just says, yeah, play a finale. So, Let's see if this thing works. Oh. Yeah. Okay. We'll see some stuff on the screen here um, as instruments come online. So we've already got the three instruments that sent to the conductor and already received a play message back. Good plan. Have free jazz. The other great thing about this demo is it's really, really long. <laughs> That's not the finale yet. So hopefully that gave you an idea of what it would be like designing actors and passing messages around. Right. How, and, and to, how to do that safely is a different, different talk. And it really, does, it really does help show that putting a thin wrapper in a particular language around whatever library you're using uh, gives it a little bit better feel. So it makes, makes Polyglot fit a little bit better even though you're losing, using different languages together. Okay, so now we've talked mostly about having these isolated as libraries, or separate domains, separate services, uh, but there are going to be cases where you want to actually directly integrate two of these languages together, uh, call directly from Java into Groovy or Ruby or Scala and so on. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about strategies for that. So uh, the simplest answer is that all of these languages speak Java. So passing Java objects around or focusing on having an interface somewhere usually ends up being the cleanest way. Uh, you can go directly from one language to another, but in almost all cases, Java is kind of the substrate, the, the, the common medium that we use to actually uh, to get data across that, that boundary. So if we look at a simple Java class here, uh, implementation of get name omitted, uh, we've got a simple structure and you know two, exam or two examples of how the languages actually call directly into the, lang in into the Java code from the language itself. Uh, Clojure has the, the dot operation here, dot get name on, on the address object. Uh, and then in Ruby, Scala and Groovy, it's pretty much just a straight up call like you would have in a regular piece of Java code. Uh, and now of course, like we mentioned in, in JRuby and in Groovy and to some extent in Scala, there's also modifications or improvements for how you call it. Uh, so in Ruby and Groovy, it might be address.name to access it. And address.name equals as an as a assignment that actually calls the setter. So we've got little shortcuts uh, in Ruby also, if you have a Boolean return value, we create a version of it that has the question mark. It's a typical way of doing a, a, a Boolean return value in a Ruby method. 
So now sometimes what you're going to run into here is that the values are going to be slightly different when they go across this boundary. Uh, the way that Scala's lists work are a little bit different from the way Java's lists work. So getting a Java list into Scala is going to be a little bit different. Uh, for JRuby, the Ruby string has a different implementation and is mutable and has different behaviors. Uh, so the string that comes in from a Java call may actually be turned into a Ruby string for Ruby purposes. Uh, there are ways in most of these languages to do an explicit coercion. So turning a list that you've gotten from Java into a Scala list or into a closure sequence. Uh, or to go in the other direction if you want to call a library that explicitly requires a Java string or a Java list, being able to convert it back from whatever the language uses. I, I, I write a lot of code between Ruby and Java, and this explicit coercion is incredibly rare because in most cases we'll actually appropriately convert back to the Java type. Right. So that's kind of the, the, the simple way is doing the language drives everything and the language calls into Java libraries and calls through Java to other languages. Uh, but if you need to call from Java into the language, it's usually a little bit trickier. In, in pretty much all of these languages, they have their own quirks. Uh, there's differences in how they dispatch, if they're dynamically typed, if uh, changes to types can happen at runtime, types are mutable. Um, if there's uh, differences in how the type systems actually fit together. Uh, for example, closure doesn't have as much of an object-oriented feel for most of the things that you do. So you don't always get an object that you can work with. You may get a, a function or a sequence that you can pass stuff to. Uh, and there's, there's a few alternatives for how you work with this. So the first one would be just to use one of the APIs that are available, like uh, JSR223, the scripting API, or a raw native API. Uh, 223 is, it, it's an okay API, it's a little coarse grained. Uh, what it's really useful for is if you have a, a chunk of code that you kind of want to toss over to a language, have it run a bunch of stuff, and then give you one result back. Uh, doing it more interactively is possible, but m not as clean. Uh, so here we're creating a new script engine manager for JSR 223, uh, starting up a groovy engine in that manager, and then just basically passing it some groovy code to execute for us. And this could be loaded out of a file somewhere or generated by uh, another piece of code. And, and Charlie spoke about this earlier, but the, the big pattern here is that you eval into the host, the other language, and it returns something that implements a Java interface. And then you can use that from Java or another language however you want, because it appears to be just Java. A, a little bit more... Uh complicated example where we actually are calling into an individual function that's been defined in Groovy. So we evaluate this Groovy code, now we have the Groovy version of factorial that we can call from Java through the scripting API using invoke function or invoke method. Now there are benefits to using JSR223. It obviously allows you to do multi-language very easily because it's the same API no matter which language you're using. Obviously the code you're sending is going to be different. Uh, you get to learn a single API, and you don't have to learn each of the individual APIs. And it also makes the polyglot boundary much more obvious. Uh, for folks that are coming into a system and trying to understand where Java starts and where Groovy begins or where Clojure begins, you can see with the scripting places where you're actually calling this. But there are a few detriments here. Uh, JSR223 is designed to be kind of opaque. Uh, so it's not very transparent, not very clear what happens on either side of that boundary. You're throwing code over, getting one result back, and if something else happens or if there's an error, you kind of have to dig a little bit. It is also kind of a lowest common denominator API. There are features in each of these languages that aren't represented well in JSR223 or don't make any sense. Uh, so it can co sometimes be cumbersome to get at those features from Java using this API. Um, and so, f at least on JRuby, we, we've often recommended that people just kind of use a, whatever the native API for embedding the language is, whatever, they, whatever we provide that gives all the features you expect. Uh, so all the obvious benefits here, you get tighter integration with the language, how its types are structured, how, the various values and, and objects and data structures that it, it's familiar with, uh, how the language features work. Uh, and there's fewer setup issues as well. All you need is to have the library for the language, call into it, construct an instance of the language, and you can do a lot more operations than you could with 2.23. Uh, there are some detriments that are basically just the opposites of the 2.23 API. Uh, language specific. Everyone has their own API, so you, if you want to use lots of different languages, you're going to learn all of those APIs. And it does require a little bit deeper knowledge of how the language itself works, how the runtime that, that runs the language works, and, and what the types are that are available. Uh, Probably the straight, most straightforward way from a Java perspective to access any of these languages is to have them generate their own regular Java class files. Uh, Java obviously likes to work with classes, and it, it hides the fact that you're even using another language. 
Most languages can generate a class file of some form so that you basically have no, no visibility that, that it's written in another language. Uh, some, as in the case of Groovy and Scala, if you compile them ahead of time, you just get Java classes out. Uh, there are still some mismatches sometimes. Groovy and Scala can define methods that Java can't call directly. Syntactically it won't, won't compile. Uh, but it, it does make it a little bit easier to use some of these languages if you can just generate regular Java code. Uh, look at the examples that are a little bit more interesting, or a little bit more unusual. Uh, Clojure has the ability to generate a class based on a piece of code or a, a Clojure script. So here we use the gen class. Uh, feature and generate a class called some example that has two string on the left or uh, implements a particular interface on the right. Uh, a little bit longer example here actually implementing Java util iterator entirely in Clojure. Uh, we have our Clojure.examples as our package. The class there is going to be in called instance and we've got an init to construct it, has next and the next implementation is all written in Clojure. Uh, now once you, what you get out of this is a, a class file actually a couple class files because Clojure generates all of the method bodies into little classes as well. Uh, but you get a normal looking class file that Java can then instantiate and call ca casting to the iterator interface and there's no concern about what's actually behind the curtain. You get to use it as if it's just a regular Java library, a regular Java class. JRuby has something similar. Uh, basically throw some signatures in here with a, a little Ruby magic, uh, compile it with our compiler and we get a normal Java class out again still implemented in Ruby behind the scenes, but you don't ever have to know that if you're just handing this off as a library to someone to include into their application. Uh, and, and kind of the halfway ground is rather than generating Java classes at compile time or at build time is driving everything from the language and just implementing interfaces on the fly. Uh, sometimes this is a little bit easier fit. The language can stay its own feel, its own way, doesn't have to use uh, Java signatures or, or bend, bend to the will of the JVM. Uh, and uh, it's also kind of more polyglot friendly in some ways. Uh, by always working towards a specific interface, you're setting up a clear contract. If the language implements that, nobody has to care, nobody has to worry about the fact that it's written in some other language. You've made it clear exactly what you're looking for. Uh, an example from Ruby, uh, and again, all of these languages can implement interfaces and provide uh, an implementation at runtime. Uh, so here we're just implementing a comparator, uh, sort of like the first Java example that we had. We can do it in one of two ways. We can either just create a normal, normal looking class, include that interface in and implement the method. Uh, no requirement here for Java signatures because we can get all that out of the interface information. Uh, and then just pass an instance of that in. We create a class that actually implements the interface, the object implements the interface, and then as far as Java, as far as the code we're calling knows, uh, this is just a normal piece of Java code. We also have another syntax at the bottom there where we can pass in a closure that implements that interface. Uh, and again, it still just looks like it's a normal comparator. Uh, nobody has to actually care or worry about the fact that it's written in some other language. Okay, close it out. So the conclusion that we want you to get from this is that you know Java is not always the best language. Uh, and there are good reasons to start looking at other languages and pulling them into your applications. Uh, but when you do it, really kind of consider the domains where these languages would fit. If you're doing a front end, if you're doing a web interface, maybe one of the dynamic languages and the frameworks that go with them works best for you. If you're doing a lot of concurrent data processing, maybe that's where you want to start putting Clojure or Scala to work. Uh, and isolate them into their own domains, keeps the integration hassles much lower and will likely make your developers a lot happier too, your, your fellow developers. All right, and that's all we have, so we have some time for questions. Thanks. All right, questions anybody? Yeah, yeah. here. Right. Yeah, you definitely can. Uh, and in the case of Scala and Groovy in, in particular, uh, there are cross compiling features, build features that allow you to have a portion of your application written in Scala 
build it all together and then call through like it's a normal Java class. Uh, the only tricky bit that you have to watch is, like I mentioned, the mismatch, making sure that whatever API you're exposing from Scala is actually callable from the Java side and keeping that in tune over, over time, uh, not using Scala features that Java can't actually express or, or call into. Uh, well, Scala can define pretty much any operator syntax, for example, plus, minus, and whatnot, and those become uh, methods that sometimes are not directly uh, referenceable. Uh, I, think it, I think they do do a, kind of an encoding of those names for, for Scala. Yeah, right. I, think you can make, I think you can make an object that represents what that symbol would be or something. Sure. But I think you have to do it reflectively. Well, for another example is doing the, the asynchronous calling. Um, you don't have the same syntax features. So this is, a, this is actually a problem that the Akka guys have run into. It's been a, a bit of a challenge for them to continue to maintain a Java API while they're still using all of the Scala features. They kind of have to keep a set of tests off to the side to make sure that they're not breaking the Java API at the same time. All right. Not, Not necessarily. necessarily. Uh, Scala, I believe, has a, a cross compiler that can do both Java and Scala at the same time. Uh, of course, if you, if you are in any of the other languages and build a set of Java interfaces everyone has to implement, that becomes your common build in the middle, and they don't have to actually know about each other's build processes. Yeah, there's, there's a dilemma with cross compilation because let's say you decide you're going to use Scala and Java. Oh, that works fine. Now you decide you want to use Scala, um, Java, and Groovy. And they all they all kind of point at each other. Then you're in trouble. Yeah. Uh, modularizing definitely makes it easier, uh, and it's where we'd recommend trying to lean when you would start to use a different language in a project. Uh, but it is possible with all these languages to get everything compiling all together too. So yeah, you. Uh, there's a, a, a book uh, by Debashish Ghosh that is kind of the, the polyglot DSL book. Uh, it actually does a very nice job of talking about all of these languages and fitting them together. That's, that's one that I would recommend. Um, other ones? Venkat has several Venkat books. Venkat has. I can't think of the title. Right. Yeah, if you search for, search for some of the books that are out there on, on polyglot JVM stuff, there, there's a few good options. Uh, check the reviews. Anything else? All right, thank you. Thanks.